This is Richard Powers, narrating a slideshow of photos of the Flying Cloud Vintage Dance Troupe, from when I founded it in 1982 to when I left for California to teach at Stanford in 1992. If you don't mind a few words before we go, I put together these photos mostly for the former members of the troupe to reminisce about those fun years. Anyone else is welcome to watch, but you might occasionally hear me referring to someone only by their first name, like Steve or Joan, as if you know who I mean. Most of these photos are from my collection, but more importantly, many have been contributed by former troop members. In a recent project to gather photos of the Flying Cloud Academy of Vintage Dance, the Summer Vintage Dance Weeks, and here the Performing Troupe. This project is spearheaded by Eric Gonsmiller and Tamara Anderson. If you have any corrections or photos to add, please let me know. My email address is at the end of the slideshow. Here we go. Before the troupe, I formed the Clifton Court Dancers in 1976 to research, reconstruct, and perform Renaissance and Baroque dance. We focused on those eras for several years. And then in 1979, I began to research and reconstruct 19th century and ragtime dances. So here we are in 1981 for this concert at the Cincinnati Art Museum. Five centuries of historic dance, early Renaissance, late Renaissance, Baroque, 19th century now, and then ragtime. As you can see, our costuming was not very good yet. Daytime attire for a ball, but we had plenty of room for improvement. And then the next year, uh, we were still the Clifton Court dancers, but when we did 19th century and ragtime dances, we changed our name of the same group to the Flying Cloud Academy of Vintage Dance, not yet the troupe. That was for this concert at St. John's Unitarian Church. And then the Flying Cloud troupe was formed, and our first performance was in November 1982 at the Cincinnati Art Museum. So we had three groups, the Cincinnati Court Dancers, the Harlequinade Baroque Dancers, and as you can see on the left-hand side, a very large group for the first Flying Cloud Vintage Dance Troupe. Here we are in our very first performance as the troupe. This was a transitional larger group. Some of the members, like Jennifer Bevan there giving an arm, were only briefly in the group. Some are still there from the court dancers. And a group shot of that first group. March 1983, Donald Thurber in Gross Point, Michigan, wanted to have a very special birthday party for his mother, who was born in 1891 and was then 92 years old. He wanted to have the dances from 1891 and from Fayetta's younger dancing days in the ragtime era. So he brought in the troupe to perform those dances. Here is a cakewalk quadrille. These were done in the Thurber's living room. And Melanie and I doing a castle walk. Back in our Cincinnati area, the 1796 Log House in Anderson Township. We had a dinner there and performed dances. Tamara is not there because she's taking this photo. And there she is toward the left, our early group. We were fortunate to have a color full front page spread in the Enquirer magazine, Sunday magazine on the Flying Cloud Academy. And that really helped spread the word about what we were doing just at the beginning of our events there. And while we are on the topic of publicity, this is from a few years later. Victoria Magazine did a spread and they came to one of our Vintage Dance Weeks to take the photos. Back to 1983, an early performance. 
uh, for a benefit for WGUC FM radio. And as you can see, we're still getting our costumes together. Lavinia in her strapless gown and oh, a few others have their first stab of a ball gown just beginning. If it's an umbrella, it must be a parlor cotillion. Mazurka. We did two performances for the Warren County Historical Society in Lebanon, Ohio, June 1983. 1983 was our first Vintage Dance Week. Actually, this was the very first historical dance week anywhere to specialize in 19th century and or early 20th century dances. And since then, there have been hundreds like this all over the world. That first year, we only had two teachers, Beth Aldrich and myself. And you can see in the far right-hand corner in the blue shirt was uh, Beth's teaching partner, Charles Garth. And uh, the troupe performed. The audience was seated in chairs, and we did Renaissance and some Baroque and mostly 19th century and ragtime dance. If you weren't dancing, you were watching in the background. Here we have a scotch reel and a cakewalk. Our youngest member, Lavinia, and our oldest member, Ian, paired off for the high kicks. All right, we had two performances almost back to back on German dances of the 19th century. This one was for the Midfest International Festival in Middletown, Ohio, and this was Joan Walton's very first performance. She might want me to point out that she was also just had her very first ball gown on its way towards something a bit more authentic. Galloping around. And we have our first of our series of Brahms Liebeslieder concerts, this time with the Cincinnati Choral Society, directed by Rick Henson, you can see on the left. Later on, we would expand on that repertoire. Back to the German dances for our second performance. This was much larger. This was for the Cincinnati International Folk Festival at the Convention Center. And we performed over three days on two stages. This was the raised stage and two sizes, our large group and our small group. Some of my photographs, by the way, are from film, from prints like this. And some I have uh, scanned from the original negatives. And you can see a difference in both the quality and the color. Antonio was dancing with us for two years before he moved to Switzerland permanently. A concert at the Art Museum again, a Dickens Christmas concert of English dances. And that piano was there on the right so that for a break I could sit down at it and play the piano for this kazoo concert waltz with the troop members singing or rather kazooing the tune. And our costuming was getting a little bit better every time. Rosalie Brown was our costume mistress helping build the costumes for the ladies. Here's one of my favorite early concerts for the Cincinnati Women's Club, still in 1984. This was April and uh, they have had a stage in their building, the Cincinnati Women's Club, and this performance had a comic skit in between each dance. And the Women's Club hung a chandelier for us and dressed the stage for us. Here is a rehearsal. Steve and Joan for their chaos tango. I see Sherry Sullivan in the background on the right. This was for one of Jim Tarbell's oddballs. This one was for the May 31st, 1984 oddball. 1984 was our second Vintage Dance Week with Desmond Strobel, Carol Teton, and Jim Morrison. And this time we mounted a large scale production on a large stage for the first time. It was called Departed Days. 
Here we are getting ready for it in the dressing room. So this is where we experimented with how to do a play with dancing on a large stage. We learned a lot by trial and error, how to keep the pace going with faster paced dances that don't lag, how to have a script and how to hear the characters. This is before we learn to use the shotgun mic from below. And this is Dino DiMario playing one of the lead roles of Atenas. Dino, doing capers high in the air, was our ballet master for the troupe. He led our Monday ballet classes in the studio across the street right before our 8 o'clock rehearsal, 7 o'clock ballet class. Here was the parlor cotillion with fencing. Steve Purser on the left, Jill, Jeffrey Hildebrand on the right, and the women admiring or being aghast. And this is the Mazurka bottle standing game, where we are standing on top of a champagne bottle. We are all let go at the same time, and who can stand stay, stay standing the longest? This is actually two photographs together. If you see, Ron Coleman's kind of split in half. So I just lined up two photos to get a lineup of four of the gents anyway. I think that's, that's four out of five. And then they let go, and who could stand the longest? It just happened to be that during the show, I was standing the longest, but it wasn't always that way in rehearsals. This was another cotillion game of stomping on the balloon. If the gent stomped on the balloon, he got to dance with that lady. In this slideshow, there will be three examples of two people taking a photograph of the same moment for, at the same time from two different angles. This is the first one toward the right. You see Joanne Jeffrey in red approaching Ian, who had just popped her balloon. They're going to dance. Just to the left of them is Anna in her green dress. At the same instant, someone in the audience took a shot of those same three. So going back, I'll blow up that one. It'll be kind of grainy. So here's one angle of that split second and the next angle. We had other entertainments in that show. This is Elaine Humphreys on harp and Dan Cook singing. They would also sing and play for our monthly balls. And we had other performances beside Departed Days. Here is a Regency era waltz. Uh, Steve and Joan had many solos. Here is their Castle Walk and their Charleston. Every year, the troupe gathered for a Christmas dinner, and this was the very first one at Grammar's. That was Jim Tarbell's other restaurant besides Arnold Bar and Grill. Here we see Richard and Wendy for the first time. They were with us for just a year. Here we see Lynn Heilman on the left for the first time. And there's Ian Scott provided the silver candelabra and other silverware in the plates. So this night had a second event after the dinner. So what I had been doing that year earlier was researching the former dance academies in Cincinnati. I had a list of 30 or 40 of them, and I was visiting the buildings where they used to be, and I found one of them was rather amazing and only two blocks away from Grammar's. So after dinner, we took what was left of the candles with us, stayed in costume, and walked down the street to enter the abandoned dance academy. I had been there once before by myself, and I knew how to get into the front window. I knew nobody would be there. Not completely illegal. And here we are. When the 19th century dance academy went out of business, various other tenants used the space, but they just set up in the middle of the floor and didn't touch the original wallpaper or the settings on any of the four floors. The previous tenant was Wellsback Lighting Company, and they had moved out. The building was for sale, and they left behind their trash of lampshades there. And there was no lighting. There was no power. So we only had this candlelight. 
uh, unless it was a flash photo, of course, like this. So backing up, here is that academy, 1313 Vine, now Wellsback Lighting Center, but the whole building was originally a dance academy. That second floor, that third floor, that top floor. So during the daylight, this is the second floor uh, dance studio, now just used for storage by the lighting company. Third floor was once another dance studio. And the top floor, that was their ballroom. So here going back to that evening in December, by candlelight having a dance. Andy Wentink, a famous author, Andrew Mark Wentink, had moved from New York to our area and joined the troupe. And here he moved into a really beautiful 19th century house on the river in Covington, and he was having a housewarming party, inviting the troopers plus some members of the Flying Cloud Academy who put on the balls. And there's Andy. And here is a troop rehearsal with some of those same faces, same year, just a month or two later, 1985. Uh, Richard and Wendy are still there. They were at the troop dinner. And we now see Dennis and Ruthie and Karen and Marsha Nilsson and Andy and Annabelle. In the back there is Steve Kreimer right side up and upside down. Re rehearsing Sharosha. This was a, uh, a bohemian version of Sir Roger de Coverley, Sharosha, Sharosh, uh, that I had learned uh, in Prague when I visited Franischek and I brought it back. And here we are visited by Ruth Page, one of the most famous dancers in history. She's in front there at the age of 86. So Andy, Andrew Mark Wentink, had edited her book page by page. So they were visiting us. Back to the troupe. This is probably the Embassy Hotel, Indianapolis, Indiana, their grand opening. But let me know if it's not. We're just guessing on that one. My birthday party, March 1985. And one of our big productions here, North and South Part 1, filmed in Natchez. We're in front of the building where the ballroom would be. And there is David Carradine. All of the actors were there in that room learning their parts for the ball scene. All but one danced, all but one of the actors. Here we are relaxing while we're in town there, the troop hanging out and drinking. Steve and Steve were always our troop cut-ups. Here we are about to take off from the landing strip. This they call the aqua drill at our hotel there. Gentlemen messing around with white gloves. Here we are first entering that mansion in the two rooms that would be the ballroom scene. So this is the before photograph, before the plants, before they moved the furniture out, before they did the final dressing. And here is the during set, during the filming. And uh, in front, on the right in the white hat, that is the director, Richard Heffron. He also directed Future World, or was it Westworld? It was about a futuristic theme park with Peter Fonda and Yul Brynner as the robot gunslinger. There we have actors in with the Flying Cloud troupe. Now in the foreground on the right with the white hair, gray hair, that is Desmond Strobel. And he directed North and South, uh, he choreographed North and South Part 1. And of course brought in the troupe. More actors mixed with troupe. Desmond's still in front on that with the rest of us. And here we have the principals, the actors for a pose. Now here, if you look over toward the right, you see Patrick Swayze standing there by the horn. 
He's the one actor I referred to earlier who did not have to learn the dances because his character was supposed to be injured and lame and could not dance. And that's ironic because he's probably one of the more highly trained dancers in the room since his mother taught ballet and Patrick took all of her classes when he was a youth and he went on to use that training in Dirty Dancing and other dancing films. So here you have Patrick Swayze standing out because he can't dance. And now if you back away from this scene, you see this. Now, if you look really closely at Patrick, he's looking out of the corner of his right eye over at what you see at the right. Desmond and Joan messing around doing something. So there's the camera on Patrick as he's probably wondering, what are they doing over there? All right, here we up to, up to 1985, our third annual Vintage Dance Week. There's Desmond teaching with Carol Teton. Uh, this is not the troupe, but a lot of tr many troupe members are in this photo of a break during the classes at the Dance Week. And our vaudeville show at that Dance Week, our stage production for the year, many, many, many acts. Here's our Cakewalk Quadrille. Notice this live music by an orchestra. That orchestra was the Capitol Quick Steps, which Steve Hickman, there playing the violin, brought in from Washington, D.C. And here we have our second moment, taken by two cameras from two angles at the same split second. Steve Shuckman doing a solo across the front, and the same instant from someone else. And here's Shalrosha again, this time performed on stage. This was a Frantishek Bonish reconstruction, but he had not yet taught at the Vintage Dance Week. And Madame Rosalie and Sheba with Chris Hanlon juggling in the background. Chris Hanlon was not yet a troop member. He was visiting down for the dance weeks. He lived elsewhere. And Joan Walton and her tap dance trio. The Commonwealth Vintage Dancers from Boston doing a tableau vivant. Uh, there is Patri Pugliese, a center right, who unfortunately has since passed away. Who else? There's Hannah Artuso, there's Bob Duffy, Charles Worsley. A barbershop quartet with Dan Paget directing that group. He's in from New York City. And the famous Drunk Dance with Steve and Joan. This is on YouTube, by the way. If you go to YouTube and put in Drunk Dance uh, Vaudeville, uh, you'll see it um, down a page or so. And see that on the right, Joan about to hit uh, Steve on the head with a bottle? That's a theatrical breakaway bottle. They had three of them, one for a rehearsal and one for the show, and that left an extra one. And Steve grabbed it, unprepared. Improvisation started uh, chasing Joan around during the finale around Chris, who was juggling. Uh, totally spontaneous. Also at that same dance week, uh, we uh, Kathy Stevens sent me this photo. We have uh, Marcia still uh, there, Marcia Nielsen. Oh, on the far right, you see Patri Pugliese seated in front of the fireplace. Later on, he would be teaching at the Vintage Dance Weeks. And here we are only half a year later at the Abandoned Dance Academy, now with the power turned on because Jim Tarbell knew the owner of the building and arranged to have it cleaned up, at least the upstairs room, and the lights turned on. It was a very hot evening, as I remember. Instead of winter, it was summer, hot. But it was still fun. Sandra Olenek dancing with Chris. Uh, we have Steve and Andy doing looks like a polka. I noticed I'm playing the music. It looks like from cassette tapes back then. And North and South Part 2 in October of the same year. New director, new choreographer. That was Kevin Connor in the middle. There was the director. And I was the choreographer that time. I don't know why they didn't ask Desmond to choreograph that, but you never know in Hollywood. And Desmond knows. He lives there in Hollywood. He knows you never know. 
Here is one of the many dance scenes. This was a shotish. Some of the scenes here, again, are from film, and some are scanned from the negative. A little bit better detail and color. Here's a grand march scene, ducking under. Here is Lloyd Bridges in one of the roles. Terry Garber, uh, the wicked one, with Philip Kasnoff in the center. Not as many of the actors were dancing as in North and South Part 1, but Philip and Terry had a waltzing scene. So here I am showing them deportment and how to waltz with the director, Kevin Connor, And a few more shots of me working with them. This looks like a rehearsal because everyone's laughing, but this is the waltz scene. Now here's a quick story. Uh, hey, there's Frank Clayton on the very far right. Uh, but anyways, look in the very far left, seated at the table with a tape recorder. That is Richard Wagner, the sound producer, the Foley man, and he plays the sound during the dance scenes. So we had filmed one scene. We were about to film the second one, and then he came up to me and he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Powers, but we cannot find the music for this next scene anywhere. We don't have it. And we're going to start filming in 20 minutes. <laughs> so I just, I laughed. I thought, this will be fun, seriously. So I asked him, well, what do you have that we're not using? And he said, well, there's, I think it's a gallop or something. And I said, okay, play it. And he played it. Yep, it was a gallop. I know that tune. So I gathered the troop around. I said, hey, gang, we're going to improvise a dance. We're going to do a gallop. So let's form two lines and we'll charge forward and back and fling the ladies from one gent to the other, you know, like we do at a ball. And then we uh, firmed it up and we did one run of it and then filmed the second take of it. And if you watch North and South Part 2, you'll see that the dancers actually look more spontaneous and natural for that than they do in the other dances. It looks less rehearsed because it was. So sometimes things turn out better when it's not what you expect. And a waltz scene. There's Samantha laughing on to the left, Joanne laughing, dancing with Frank Clayton. That's genuine merriment everywhere. And there's a lot of waiting around, as you might know, when you make a film. That was a full year. This is only one year later at the second annual Troop Dinner at Grammar's. Again, with Ian's Candelabra and Silverware. 1986 saw the fourth annual Vintage Dance Week. And this time we brought in Professor Frantisik Bonish from Prague. This would be the first of five times that he would teach for the Vintage Dance Weeks. And here we have the first script reading of Mrs. Perkins's Ball. This was a very ambitious project started by Andy Wentink, who was working at WCET Channel 48 Public Television, and he wrote a screenplay for William Makepeace Thackeray's Mrs. Perkins's Ball. This project had the troop members acting as well as dancing, and it also brought in the next wave of members of the troop. Here we see for the first time Ray and Foster Wigand. We see Pat Golder, Paul Trageser, Cindy Amneas, John Amneas. We'll see both of them right now dancing there in the center. You might remember John had been in the Clifton Court Dancers and then finally joined the troupe here. WCET had professional photographers shooting during the filming, so we have some very nice photos of this. And here we see Linda Kiefer for the first time. The Fleeting Moments Orchestra formed a quintet to record all of the music for the production, and then they played themselves uh, as the band, the orchestra, playing during the ball. Here we are filming, and in the background you can see that mixed in amidst the Flying Cloud troupe were members of the Flying Cloud Academy who come to the balls, like uh, Rick Prairie and the White Hair and Beard and quite a few of the others. I see, is that uh, Debbie Gorenflo in the center with the white? And far right looks like Rich Kern, and is that Ray Werner behind him? 
So Academy mixed in with the troop. Uh, a sad picture here only because all three, Will and Will Hamrick and Ray and Foster Wygant, have all since passed away. They contributed so much to the troop. Uh, at the very end of this slideshow, I will have a page in memoriam to many of the troop members whom we've lost. More pictures from Mrs. Perkins's ball. Hope I'm not going too fast. And here is everyone in a long way set for La Tempette. And they're leading the line at the far right. We see Leslie Conradi Hodge for the first time. And here we have a tracking shot zooming in on Rosalie. She's sitting there on the far left playing a wallflower all by herself. So as the voiceover is talking about her, the camera zooms in on her, tracks in on her. Then after we shoot a scene, everybody sits down or stands around and watches it with amusement, as you can see. And here is our group photo of everyone. I only have this here because I don't have any photographs of the College of Mount St. Joseph show here. If you do, please send me one. I have the video, but no still photos. We did Mrs. Perkins's ball and several, three other sets. This is the infamous B&B, &B, the blizzard and ball. This was for the Stephen Foster National Conference in Pittsburgh. It was in April, April 3rd, 1987, but there was a blizzard driving there, or was it driving home, or both? But it was a beautiful ballroom. Joining the troupe on the road for the first time are John and Cindy, and Ray and Foster, and over on the right, Chris Hanlon. They had been in the College of Mount St. Joseph concert, but we don't have any photographs of that. This one, we're not sure. It might be Spring Valley Centennial Exhibition, July 1987. If you know otherwise, please let me know. This was at one of the monthly Flying Cloud Academy balls, and I'm not showing the hundreds of photographs I have of the balls, but all four of these are troop members. Our quartet, Joan and Samantha and Pat and Will. They not only sang at the balls, but they also performed on stage in our dance concerts occasionally. They had beautiful voices. It was an amazing quartet. Pat Golder again. So this is the only photograph I have of another major production, Keepsakes, on Corbett Auditorium during our Vintage Dance Week. And if you have any photographs of Keepsakes, let me know. We do have the video. Uh, there on the far right facing the camera in the background is the first photograph I see of John McCain just joining the troupe. Uh, here's our first stab at late 19th century choreographies. This is Cincinnati Art Museum, which you probably recognize by now, for their Duvenek Day concert. And, and Duvenek, the painter, was late 19th century. So we had the choreographies and reconstructions down pretty well, but we were just starting to get uh, women's fashions for the late 19th century down. There is always a first stab at anything. Not bad for a first try. And by coincidence, nearby the Cincinnati Art Academy, they had a centennial Beaux-Arts Ball, and they wanted late 19th century. So we did the same dances, but this time with live music by our Fleeting Moments Waltz and Quickstep Orchestra. And here the troupe is performing at a centennial of a centennial. As you can see from the banner in the background, this is recreating the Cincinnati Centennial Ball from 1788 founding to 1888. And of course, now this was the bicentennial. And also for the bicentennial, back to the art museum for a bicentennial exhibit of historic costumes. And we performed for that. several eras. 
Uh, this is back to a vintage dance week. In 1988, we decided not to do a stage production. So we did exhibitions to live music in our heliotrope ballroom. Now, let's see, in the background right, you see John Amneas and Rosalie, who had been making all of the costumes. And one of the participants and teachers, Jim Borism, looks like next to her. At uh, the same week, we were rehearsing for that performance, probably. And you again have jo uh, Joan and Steve messing around. And speaking of messing around, here we have Chris and John and Steve messing around. What can we do with top hats? Uh, Nancy McKinley, Nan McKinley, had just joined us in there. 1987. This was 1988 for the National Governors Conference down at the Cincinnati Riverfront. Doing the shag here with Chris. And you can guess who this is and what dance that was. Pretty high kicks, huh? And here we have another film, Cold Sassy Tree, with Richard Widmark and Faye Dunaway. They asked me to choreograph the ragtime dance that those two did together, and I replied that I could not find the time in my workshop schedule to fly out to Hollywood, and I suggested that I make a video of what to do, and it worked. So here we have a posing of five different ragtime handholds for them to choose from. And then for their dance, I put together a little sequence, a choreography of what to do next and next. And I was really surprised when I saw the film that they did exactly that sequence. And a troop Christmas dinner, maybe 1988, maybe 1987. Let me know if you're certain. The photographs by Candle Candlelight look quite different from the ones by Flash. And uh, these are many photos of the, it was a big production, the Cincinnati Bicentennial Birthday Ball at the Cincinnati Club. So the full troupe was there, the full Fleeting Moments Orchestra, many other guests and patrons. You can see it's Christmas time with the wreath. Did both eras. A little bit of pink in the upper left on the wall is a dancing pig, or probably a flying pig. Also there, flying pigs in the background. Must be a mazurka. Here we are uh, making another movie, Glory, with Matthew Broderick, filmed down in Savannah. By chance, I happened to be scheduled to teach in Paris while it was being filmed, so I was not there. But we rehearsed in Cincinnati, and a fairly large group went down. This is just some of them who happened to be wandering around town. And at a rehearsal in a hotel there. A rehearsal on the set. I'm guessing this is a rehearsal because on that doorway on the building is empty. And in the film that was filled with, uh, looked like an African-American children's choir singing. Another rehearsal shot, it looks like. Chris Hanlon just sent these to me yesterday. I took this screen capture from the film itself. There you see that choir on the steps. Looks like Chuck Strain and Bonnie San in the front. And is that Dennis and then Lynn behind them? And here's saying goodbye at the airport. And what you see in the, there in the left, that's Carla Brothers. Now she played the role of an actual historical person. Charlotte Fortin was an African-American woman who knew the, uh, one of the uh, principals in the film, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, who was played by Matthew, Matthew Broderick. And in actual history, both uh, the Colonel and Charlotte Fortin had both written in their journals about meeting each other. So in the film script, they developed a relationship between these two, and that was why there was a ball scene. But then in the editing, they cut out Carla which means they cut out much of the ball scenes. And you still see the dancers behind some of the dialogue. Here we are back in Michigan for Donald Thurber again. He, wanted, he loved the Lambeth Walk. He wanted that for his guests and other dancers, dances, and he built this outdoor tent this time. Here, singing trio. Our orchestra leader was Doug Bristol, and that's his wife, Dawn Bristol, in the center, singing with Joan and Samantha. 
And while we were in Michigan, we did a gig at the Henry Ford Museum, Lovett Hall, which Henry Ford had built for his dance master, Benjamin Lovett. It had a beautiful sprung floor. So we put on a ball with the full Fleeting Moments Orchestra and the troupe. I percepted the ball and the troupe performed exhibitions in between the waltzes and quadrilles. Here's a refreshment break out on the veranda on the second floor where the ballroom is. And it looks like we're posing for this picture. This is probably the 1989 Vintage Dance Week troupe exhibitions there. This is the Regency Lancers Quadrille. It was quite a feat to piece these together. That last one was pretty sure of the date, but this had the same bunting, that same red bunting. So I figured, well, maybe must be 1989 Vintage Dance Week. And the same here. So each of these photographs was in a different location, and it was quite a project to piece them together, figure out the date from who was in it, which two must be the same location. It was fuzzle, fun puzzle work. Our big production in 1989, back to the main stage at Corbett. Will Hamrick had written a script based on Moliere's Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme and uh, the, the Bourgeois Gentleman, and he called it the Ragtime Gentleman. Quite a production with uh, live music on stage and professional actors in amidst the dancers. Chris Handlin recently sent me this picture of a tango from the Ragtime Gentleman. And for the third and last time, we have two photographs of the same moment. So there you can see in the back, Joan Walton being dipped upside down by Steve Kreimer. And at that very same split second, someone at the, in the audience took the shot. And there's our group photo, the Ragtime Gentleman. Rosalie organized a party for the troupe called Come As You Art, where the purpose was to dress up or recreate famous works of art. You probably recognize the death of Marat here. Lynn sent me this photo of Anna as the jolly toper. It could be sculpture instead of art. This is the St. Louis Arch. Instead of the Whistler's mother, we have Crimer's mother. All right, this was another troop dinner. This might have been when we shifted from December to January. This might be 1990, possibly 1989. And now the troop goes to the Soviet Union. Yes, it was still Soviet back in 1990. And Cincinnati had a sister city still does, Kharkiv in the Ukraine. So the Flying Cloud Troop and a, a music group called Ekimi and Kathy Wade, a singer. We performed at several large theaters in Kharkiv. Here's some local publicity. And we have Chris juggling outside while waiting for transportation. And of course, we have our local Lennon look-alike, Steve Kreimer, had to make that pose. These two probably should not be up there. Now, if you were thinking that they are sitting up there in St. Petersburg, that's technically not true. That was Leningrad. But you know, I didn't want to call it Leningrad. I call it St. Petersburg, and all of us did back then. After our last performance, there was a party hosted by there by Kharkiv's folk dance group. And folk dancing is really big there, supported by the city. Now, the year before, we had hosted a party for them when that dance group came to Cincinnati for the previous cultural exchange. So here they returned the favor by throwing a really big party for us. On the way back, we go through London, and this is up on the third floor of a hotel. And of course, the Steves had gone along the ledges outside of the third floor to surprise Linda Kiefer. 
Here we return to Levitt Hall in Dearborn, Michigan for the second time out of three years in a row. So this was 1990. We would return the next year. Troop performing exhibitions in between the public's waltzes and quadrilles at a ball. Eric and Carla in the upper left joined the troupe in 1990. This is 1991, a performance for the New York Chiropractic College in New York. This looks like a Steven Spender backdrop. He was a photographer who took group photos at many of our Vintage Dance Weeks. This would probably be 1991, and in the center of the gentleman is Michael Sharp, one of the only photographs I have of him. He performed with the Cincinnati Ballet Company for many years, and after he retired, he joined our vintage dance troupe, did some of our solos and some of our performances. Unfortunately, he has also passed away. And in front of the same background, we have Leslie surrounded by adoring gentlemen. From the lower left, we have Sven Jensen from San Francisco and Steve Kreimer, Chris Hanlon, Michael Atkinson, and Chuck Strain. Chuck recently told me that there's a certain reason why Leslie is smiling that way, but he didn't tell me the reason. So that 1991 Vintage Dance Week had a 19th century ball for everyone at the Cincinnati Music Hall Ballroom. And I just taught the Can Can Quadrille, so some of the troupe knew it from their performances and rehearsals, but some of the participants, like there in the blue dress is Martha Griffin from Connecticut. She had just learned it. She's leading, uh, yeah, she's leading Cindy and performing it there. This looks like the 1991 troupe dinner. And down at the end, kind of in the dark, is our newest member, Nico Hilferink, next to his wife, Maki. Both of them had performed for the National Ballet of Canada. And he did the solos that Michael Sharp had done. He was also our ballet master, as Michael had been. This was a beautiful concert, one of my favorites. The Brahms, Liebes Leader and Zagoyne Leader dances, performed in the Netherland Hall of Mirrors with the Vocal Arts Ensemble, directed by Earl Rivers. You see Nico there, standing in front of the piano toward the left. He joined us for that concert and also did the 1856 tango solo with Joan. This is the only photograph that I have, so let me know if you have another photo from that evening. And I put the full video of the full concert on YouTube so you can watch it, and I'm linking it below this YouTube video. Just a couple of concerts performances left here. This is at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., and on their stage we perform dances from all eras. Regency, of course. 19th century, of course. <coughs> Another solo, the 1856 tango, Stephen Joan. Ken Con Quadrille again. And this is the halftime bow for the 19th century set before intermission. And then coming back for ragtime, he looks like a grizzly bear there. I just recently came across these negatives and scanned the negatives. And a tango. And our final, final bow. Final performance here I do not have any photos of, so this is a reminder if you have any photos of the Crowning Glories concert for the 1992 10th Annual Vintage Dance Week, please send them to me. And here is the group photo from that 10th Anniversary Vintage Dance Week. Vintage dancers from coast to coast from all over. Are you in this photo if you are watching this? And the last photo here is a special one for me. This is five years later at the 15th uh, anniversary Vintage Dance Week, the Crystal Anniversary. And our ball, it looks like a 20th century ball, is in the Art Deco Hall of Mirrors at the Netherlands. But 
We asked to have a group photo of anybody who has ever been in the troop from the beginning, including the current troop in 1998. And quite a few members have passed away since then, but they're all in this photo. Nobody had passed away yet. And so this slideshow is in memoriam of those whom we have lost. Once again, if you have any uh, more photographs or if you think any of the dates or places are wrong, uh, let me know. You can email me. I hope you enjoyed the show.